And then Ms. Lowenthal. Welcome. Item number two, AB 157. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senators. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Chair for working with me to craft the amendments that improve the bill. Assembly Bill 157 is a disaster relief bill that will help survivors of the devastating 2003 Cedar Fire to replace their destroyed properties. I introduced this bill as a simple way to provide a realistic timetable for those losses that survivors have suffered. With me today, supporting the bill, is Christopher Carlisle from the California Association of Realtors. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oftentimes, these things take a while to work out with insurers, and so the additional two years is needed. Uh, I think the uh, committee's suggested amendment, which the uh, assembly member has taken, is a good one, and uh, we ask for your I vote. You already amended. All right. Um, further uh, support? Any opposition? Come forward. All right, are there any questions? Uh, we cannot move a motion until we have a quorum. Uh, so at that moment, uh, we will move a due pass. Oh, okay. All right, would you like to close? Yeah, just real quickly. Uh, we have fire recovery Everybody. groups in support of this bill, local chambers, and more than 100 individuals in my district that su support the bill. I ask for an I vote. And, and thank you very much for your amendments. I appreciate the improvements. You're welcome. Good bill. Thank, thank you. you. Assemblymember Lowenthal, come forward. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for hearing this bill today. I cannot overstate the importance of this courthouse project to the city of Long Beach or to the county of Los Angeles. Replacing our dilapidated courthouse cannot happen soon enough. It's one of the worst in the state in terms of physical condition, overcrowding, and in terms of the safety of those who work there or who must go there seeking justice. As you know, the administrative office of the courts has come up with a public-private financing plan that will guess, get this project done years sooner than would otherwise be possible. The details of that plan, however, have pushed the project into a gray area when it comes to taxation. AB 1341 says that this project should fall outside the typical parameters of possessory interest taxation, just as its financing structure falls outside the typical parameters of a lease leaseback deal. So we found ourselves in a situation where this long-awaited courthouse project and the jobs it Springs could be postponed for years unless we solve this problem. But I'm happy to say that Judicial Council and the County of Los Angeles have done a great job of finding a compromise without creating a precedent. I also want to acknowledge the diligent work and guidance provided by committee staff. And on that note, I would like to take as author's amendments the changes suggested in the analysis. I have with me Kurt Child and Brad Heinz from the AOC to provide additional information. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Kirk Child uh, with the Judicial Council. Um, and as uh, Assemblymember Lowenthal has, has noted, this uh, project uh, replaces one of the worst courthouses that we have in, in the state of California. It's dangerous. It's dilapidated. We hear 75 to 100 felony cases in there uh, every day and have had uh, serious incidents, uh, risks to uh, courthouse users and including jurors. Uh, so the Judicial Council has put this at, really at the top of their list uh, for a replacement uh, project. Uh, as we are looking at, uh, we, we have another 56 or so projects that are uh, in development right now, but this was one that uh, Governor and the Legislature was interested in looking at is doing a performance-based uh, procurement and uh, development of the project. And so in the, the 2007 Budget Act, the along with the Trial Court Facilities Act, um, we were directed to look at doing a, a performance-based uh, contract for this uh, project. And ultimately, the Judicial Council did elect to do that project, brought it back to the Department of Finance, back to JLBC uh, for the approval. And so we have now been moving to um, to get that in place. The, the, the PBI 
as they're known in this one, is really a very um, creative and innovative arrangement uh, where a private sector service provider um, enters into a service agreement uh, with us, and that is to do a design, a build, a finance, and an operate and maintain um, this facility over a period of 35 uh, years, um, and and subject to very clear specified performance measures uh, that was part of this in, entire project. In fact, last week uh, a report uh, put out an international report uh, listed this as one of the uh, 100, uh, top 100 uh, interesting projects in the uh, world to be looking at now as an infrastructure development. Um, so so this, this PBI was never intended um, really to, to create a possessory interest. Um, it was specifically planned around uh, a operations agreement with, uh, with our project uh, partner uh, that would include the facility. But as Assemblymember noted, some questions have been raised now, and so we think it necessary to get those uh, resolved. And this bill is an attempt to, to clarify that. Um, I just want to make one point, uh, if I may, on this, is that the, the estimates are that this could be create about a four or five million dollar annual um, uh, obligation that would essentially be the state general fund uh, obligation uh, to meet. So over the life of this project, uh, you know, up to 150 million dollars. That probably would um, kill this project, making it not economically feasible to to do that. We'd come back and do a traditional procurement, uh, do a traditional built building. Uh, certainly that wouldn't be subject to any possessory interest. It would be a state building, but it would take us two or three more years to get to that point uh, in this sorely needed project. Okay, thank you. And yes. In support. I'm Brad Hines, and I'm a senior attorney with the Judicial Council. Uh, I've been working on this project for... Over I'm, going a year. To, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. We will establish a quorum. Please call the roll. Walk here. Walk present. Alquist. Ashburn. Padilla. Present. Padilla present. Walters. Uh, here. Walters present. We have a quorum. Um, please continue. So, as, as Curtis uh, mentioned, this was a project that was supported by all branches of government through legislation and and otherwise, and uh, we. In, in, in the inception of this project, did not consider this to, to there to be any possessory interest tax issue whatsoever. Had we considered that there was a possessory interest tax issue at all, it would have been possible, of course, in the enabling legislation to have addressed that issue. Uh, frankly, we went through the uh, beginning of the procurement process on this, and uh, we 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 came and we encountered the issue of how to address the obligation and the, of the state to make the payment annually for the courthouse. So, uh, as you know, it has to be appropriated annually. The uh, the the vendor is looking at the fact that this is an essential facility, a court facility that we cannot abandon as the reason they will uh, move forward and build this for us. Uh, otherwise, they'd be looking at building this building as, as a courthouse and then being stuck with the courthouse if at some point in time we decided not to make the payment. So this is an essentiality argument that has to be, of course, supported by the obligation to remove us from the courthouse should the legislature decide not to appropriate a payment in any given year for this courthouse. The way to, uh, the way to address that is was decided to put into place a lease and sublease. That lease and sublease has no economic consequence for this transaction other than providing the developer the right to, to remove us from the courthouse if there is a non-appropriation. All of the fees through this process are through the project services agreement. We pay a services fee. There is no money exchanged for the, under the lease and the sublease back. I'll ask you to sum up. Uh, the uh, the uh, 
Possessory interest under Section 107A provides that the definition of that is that it must be independent, durable, and ex exclusive. AB 1341 clarifies that the private entity does not gain an independent interest in the Long Beach Courthouse uh, premises, which is exclusively owned and occupied by government entities. Existing law defines independence as the ability to exercise authority and exert control. These are the documents that prescribe for the project company in detail what they must do for us. They have no independent uh, control over how the courthouse is run or what services they provide. It's very tightly circumscribed. This is exactly the type of case that uh, should fall within 107A, and we support the legislation that, that clarifies that that is the case. Thank you. Uh, in support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, Michael Arnold, representing the city of Long Beach. Um, and I would urge the members of the committee not to get caught in the, um, in the, uh, down in the weeds here to talk about, you know, what is independent interest and, where is it, and whether it's a durable ownership or whatever. Uh, the city of Long Beach uh, has been working with the Judicial Council and others for the past five years and with this legislature to try to move forward with some public-private partnership projects in a fashion that makes sense for uh, for the citizens of the state of California. Don't let this public-private partnership fall based upon some kind of um, very narrow look at what is the possessory interest or what isn't the possessory interest. Um, uh, the most important point from a public policy standpoint, I think, is that if if this is not built as a public-private partnership, it's built as a government project where nobody's going to pay any possessory interest, nobody's going to pay any taxes, at least with respect to moving this forward as a public-private partnership, you're going to get it built quicker, you're going to get it up and running um, uh, so that it can be used by the citizens, you're going to replace this piece of property. And in fact, uh, there is some potential that on the on the site where um, the courthouse is located, there may be some possessory interest tax paid on some of the uses of that property. So you'll get a tax paid on the basis of some of the property that didn't previously exist. And most importantly, as a part of this transaction, there's a whole separate parcel of property um, that is going to be a part of the transaction, very complicated transaction that's going to go off of the public rolls and, um, uh, and onto private tax rolls uh, in the city of Long Beach. So I would just urge you to vote for this very, very narrow um, exemption um, from the possessory interest law so that we can move forward with the public-private partnership because this is the first one we've done, and if it poops out, you know, we're likely not going to be able to do any others. Thank you very much. Other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Uh, any discussion from... Oh, I'm sorry. Witnesses in opposition? Good morning. My name is Joel Butler. I'm the Yolo County Assessor, and I'm here also uh, rep as the Vice Chairman of the California Assessors Association Legislative Committee. And one of our propositions basically here is we, we do believe that this is a possessory interest the way it is written. Uh, it has been reviewed by the staff at Los Angeles County, and uh, it meets the it appears to meet the tests in Section 107 of independence, durability, exclusivity, profitability. Um, we believe also that in order to exempt property, real property from assessment, that it needs to be a constitutional amendment, that, uh, that you cannot just legislate exemptions to real property assessment of ad valorem taxes. Um, The Los Angeles County Assessor and the Chairman Larry Ward, the Assessor of Riverside County, have both written letters in opposition to this bill uh, that I find it very disingenuous that the letter from the, the courts basically says we don't want to set a precedent in Los Angeles County. He just mentioned that they got 56 projects in the pipeline, several very eminently, one in Yolo County that a courthouse has already been had a site selection and things. And the fact that they would promise this not to be a precedent for just the city or for the county of Los Angeles uh, when they have this many more 
So are we going to be going down this, this road for each and every county as these they build these courthouses in every county that they plan to exempt them from, such as Joel County, once they sign a contract there? Um, uh, that, uh, again, I say is why, why just pick out and say we're not going to do the challenge this again in, in Los Angeles County because we probably aren't going to build any more projects there, I suspect, as these 50, other 56 projects are going to be scattered throughout the state. But, again, it's, uh, it's amazing to me, I guess, that the judicial system ignores the laws as far as providing the notice of... Uh, that a possessory interest might exist in such a, a development that, uh, and that, uh, again, revenue exists. Uh, assessors aren't really revenue generators, but we do need to point out the fact that we're talking four to five million dollars in lost tax revenue to the jurisdiction. This will include school districts, which will affect the state's general fund, the, the cities, the county uh, budgets. And if there are 56 other projects throughout the state, then this is going to be a momentous number that we are eventually talking about uh, throughout the state. Again, if it's not a possessory interest, we don't need that clause in the tax law. If it is a possessory interest, then we believe it needs a constitutional amendment in order to exempt from taxation. Thank you, Mr. Butler. It's good to see you. Thank you. Nice My assessor. You. In opposition. All right, uh, hearing none, I will allow you to close. Are there questions, first of all, um, to the author? All right, uh, my recommendation is going to be to do pass as amended. Um, the effort of the committee is to n narrow this, and we believe we've done that uh, due to the unique circumstances here. And uh, that's what we believe we've done, and um, for that reason, uh, I do support uh, that we move this forward um, as do pass as amended. Um, would you like to close? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate your recommendation. This is a unique <coughs> circumstance and a clarification uh, that does not set a precedent. And so for that reason, I request an I vote. Thank you. Is there a motion? It's been moved. Please call the roll. Wolk? Aye. Wolk, aye. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Ashburn? Aye. Ashburn, aye. Padilla? Aye. Padilla, aye. 4 zero. 4 to 0, it passes. Thank you very we much. We will leave the roll open for our other uh, Appreciate member. that. Okay. Thank you. Um, we had a bill before. Uh, uh, we had the quorum. Now we have a quorum. It is item number 2, AB 157. The recommendation was due pass. Do I have a uh, motion? It's been moved. Uh, please call the roll. Wolk? Aye. Wolk, aye. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Ashburn? Aye. Ashburn, aye. Padilla? Aye. Padilla, aye. Four to zero. Four to zero. That is out. We will leave the roll open. Do we have another audit? Mr. Swanson. We do. Mr. Swanson, come forward. Item number four, AB 1973. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, let me thank the Chair uh, and our staff for uh, for working with us uh, on amendments to the bill. I think the bill's a better bill as a result of it. Um, AB 1973 uh, has uh, uh, traveled thus far uh, with uh, great bipartisan support, uh, receiving no no votes. Uh, this uh, bill aims to provide incentives for small businesses to hire individuals that have had trouble finding work during this difficult economic period and the formerly incarcerated. AB 1703 simply adds uh, uh, former felons, uh, nonviolent, non-sex offenders, uh, and people that have been unemployed for more than 12 consecutive months uh, uh, to the uh, current tax credit that has already been funded uh, in the last year's budget. Currently, small businesses receive $3,000 credit for each net employee increase. This bill will allow small businesses to receive an additional $2,000 for a total of $5,000 credit for hiring uh, a, uh, a formerly incarcerated person or a person that has been unemployed for 12 consecutive months. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I would ask for your aye vote. All right. Witnesses in support? Any witnesses in opposition? Are there questions from the committee? The, move, uh, the bill has been moved. Please call the roll. Recommendation do pass. Wolk? Aye. Wolk, aye. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Ashburn? Aye. 
Aye. Ashburn, aye. Padilla? Aye. Padilla, aye. Four to zero. Four to zero. The bill is out. We will leave the roll open uh, for Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Mr. Hall, you're next. I like the rhythm here. <laughs> Rhythm's good. Welcome. Thank you. Good. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair and members, AB 2017 is a, comp uh, a compromise proposal worked out with Senator DeSanye. Uh, the bill will allow state taxpayers to voluntarily contribute to the California Youth Leadership Fund through a tax checkoff donation on their uh, tax return. Donations would be used to help finance the YMCA Youth and Government Program, the California Youth Legislature, the African American Youth Leadership Program, the Asian Pacific Youth Leadership Project, and the Chicano Latino Youth Leadership Project. These groups offer unique uh, civic education experiences that have positively impacted the lives of thousands and thousands of children. Unfortunately, cost to operate and uh, and participants uh, to the cost to operate and for participants to function in these programs have increased significantly, uh, shutting many children out as a result of the cost uh, impact. Uh, AB 2017 and SB 516 will help with those costs, uh, helping these programs to ultimately continue. I respectfully ask for your I vote, and we have uh, Mr. Merchant, the governor of YMCA Youth Legislature, and Steve Wilmot, um, uh, California Alliance of YMCAs with us as well. Hey, welcome. Mike's on. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senators of the Committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Hoffman. I am the Lieutenant Governor of California YM, or California Youth and Government, uh, associated with the YMCA, and we strongly support this bill. All right, and support? Yes, Madam Chair and members, Judy Miller on behalf of the California State Alliance of YMCAs and strong support. Thank you. Further support? Just identify yourselves, please. Veronica Villalobos with the Chicano Latino Youth Leadership Project Board. Thank you. We're in support. Welcome. I'm Georgette Nimura. I'm president of the board of directors of the Asian Pacific Youth Leadership Project, and we are very strongly in support. Thank you. Kasanya Ursary, executive director of the Research and Policy Institute of California, home of the African American Youth Leadership Program, and we strongly support. Thank you. Support. Rolf Davidson, California YMCA Youth and Government, strongly in support. Further support? Any opposition? Please come forward. Hearing none, are there questions from the committee? All right, do I have a motion? I hear the bill has been moved. Would you like to close, Mr. President? I respectfully ask for your vote and thank you for your support. Before we move to the vote, I would like to thank you for uh, working out a, a really fine compromise on thank this bill, you. and thank you for doing that. No, and thank you for working, working with us to make sure that we're able to meet the sure, thanks. Thank you. Great. Please call the roll. Motion is to pass. Walk. Aye. Walk. Aye. Walters. Aye. Walters. Aye. Alquist. Yeah. Ashburn. No. Ashburn. No. Padilla. Aye. Padilla. Aye. Three to one. Three to one. The bill is out. I will leave it open for uh, our uh, other member. Um, I'm waiting for. We will take. Um, let's do the uh, reconsideration vote only bill, uh, which is item number nine. And then I will ask if we don't have an author. We do have an author from the committee. Uh, AB 2375, um, Assemblymember Knight, the recommendation uh, is no. Um, uh, this is a reconsideration vote only. Um, there are a number of problems that were identified uh, in the hearing. Um, the changes uh, to the Board of Equalization Authority and waiving interest in a number of situations uh, much too much flexibility providing and relief of interest in some taxpayer situations and not others. Uh, and federal law allows a much narrower exemption for waiving interest. Um, please call the roll. Walk? No. Walk, no. Walters? Aye. Walters, aye. Alquist? Ashburn? Aye. Ashburn, aye. Padilla? All right. The vote is? Is 2-1. Uh, 1-2. One. One, two. Yeah. Two, one. Two, two one. one. All right, and we will hold the roll open. All right, uh, Senator Ashburn. 
And would you please call Senator Calderon? He is the last author on our list. Uh, Senator Ashburn, welcome. Item Thank number you. One. Thank you. This bill is back before the committee, and I appreciate the consideration that has been uh, afforded to the change that took place that uh, affected use tax filers, new regulations, new requirements, insufficient time for the uh, administering agency, the Board of Equalization, to uh, prepare their rules and regulations and notification to the taxpayers. So the bill does two things. It deals with the immediate situation where an extension needs to be granted. And so this bill grants a six-month extension. And then, rather than have taxpayers who were unaware, not notified of their obligation, uh, to have abatement of the penalties that have been assessed against them. That's the first part of the bill, dealing with the, the current uh, year of obligation. Going forward, the bill proposes to establish uh, dates for filing, which will be clear in statute, and uh, that would be January 31st for calendar year filers and July 31st for fiscal year filers. Uh, with respect, th So that is the bill uh, dealing with the immediate, and that's why it is an urgency measure, and, and dealing with the uh, issue going forward. I have been to the Board of Equalization, to the full board, uh, before uh, Chairman uh, Jerome Horton's legislative committee, uh, I've been in close consultation with each of the members of the Board of Equalization. The Board of Equalization, well, I don't want to characterize their position. Well, let me let me just speak for uh, for the chairwoman of the board, Betty Yee, with whom I spoke late last night, and she supports this bill uh, in its form, uh, in its current form, including the abatement of the penalties. Uh, it, absent uh, an abatement of the penalties. Uh, taxpayers are going to be required to individually apply for relief from the penalties that are being assessed. That is going to be an extremely time-consuming process for the tax filer, obviously, but it, it's going to incur big new costs on the Board of Equalization in excess of the revenue to be derived. And so, uh, for that reason, I would urge the committee uh, to accept the bill in its current form and, uh, and let's get this resolved and get it to the governor as quickly as possible because tax uh, filers who have this obligation need clarity and relief uh, right away. So, thank you. Okay. Senator Ashburn, uh, in support of the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, Mira Gurton here on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce in support of this measure. And we wanted to thank the Senator for being willing to come forward and, and carry this fix for us. Um, and on behalf of Spidel, who's not able to be here today. Um, this program was something that industry was um, behind because we know that use tax is something that all taxpayers have an obligation to pay and we believe that they should be encouraged and supported to pay it. <laughs> However, um, due to the late implementation date of the program, there was not a lot of time for taxpayers to learn about a tax that many of them don't know about um, and to get um, the different infrastructure in place to help them file online, to request penalty relief, or uh, request extensions if they needed to. And so as a result, there's just been a lot of confusion. In addition, the dates that taxpayers were expected to file were not aligned with things that a lot of small businesses were expecting, which would be um, usually three months after whenever their fiscal year ends. So many of them are just going to be learning about this obligation belatedly as they, you know, finally start to sort through all the documentation they have. Um, this is probably why at this date, fewer than 50% of people who have been registered by the board have actually filed and paid a return. Um, so our goal here is really to increase compliance and to make some accommodations for people under a pretty unusual circumstance. Um, people did not understand that they were supposed to start reporting this year. We understand they should, and we would like to see them do that going forward, and we have continued to work with our members to make sure they know that this is a tax they've owed since 1935. Um, and I just wanted to respond really briefly to the comments about penalty relief. I know in the analysis it mentioned that this seemed like an extreme um, grant of penalty relief. However, we agree with uh, Chair Betty Yee and also with the author that it's necessary in this case. We have about a million dollars of penalties that according to board policy would be waived if people requested them. However, they file online electronically. They have to go and sort through the website to get the paper form to request the penalty relief. And many of them, if it's three or four dollars, they're not requesting 
getting the relief. So we're balancing, you know, the budget on the backs of people who have complied with the thing with the policy on time, and we believe that's inappropriate. So that's why we support this measure. Thank you and support. I concur with the remarks. Oh, Michelle Peel Sticker, California Taxpayers Association. I concur with the remarks of Ms. Gurton from Cal Chamber. Thank you, Senator, for carrying the bill. I think this will be very good for taxpayers going forward. Okay. In support of the bill. Uh, just briefly, yes, identification. No, no. We, we supported this last time, and we stand yeah, now. Just identification. We're uh, letting go over California tax reform. Okay. Assistance. Yes, I remember. Including Thank you. Abatement. Yeah. Right. Including the re relief of penalties. Yeah. Abatement. No, that's the bill. Yeah. Jennifer Tannehill uh, with Aaron Reed and Associates on behalf of the California Society of Enrolled Agents. We support the bill. Appreciate the efforts of the author to uh, gain compliance. Okay. Uh, further support? Opposition? All right. Hearing none. Uh, Senator Ashburn, uh, let, me, let me just um, uh, be clear about uh, what you're asking. Um, there are uh, several parts to this bill. Um, changing the structure uh, allowing the reasonable extension of time for the BOE, changing the date. Uh, those uh, I support, and that's uh, part of your bill. Then there's waiving of all penalties, uh, 08, 07, 08, and 09, um, which I do not support um, as chair. Uh, would you like to remove that portion of the bill? Uh. And the reason I ask you that is that I think... Right now, in order to get a, uh, uh, a waiver, you know, it's, it's, it's all the taxpayer needs to do is write a letter, you know, to the BOA. The process, you know, showing good cause as to why they could not comply. I mean, that, it seems to me it couldn't be simpler. Um, and uh, the cost of this is close to a million dollars. So that, um, that creates a problem for me. I accept the changes in that you suggest. I think they're good ones. You've worked hard on this, but I cannot, I cannot support uh, the waiver of all penalties. So um, perhaps you'd like to speak to that issue. Well, and I respect your position. We've discussed it previously, mm -hmm. and, and I've been clear in, in understanding your position on it. I, I mean, the tax administering agency doesn't agree. They believe that under the circumstances of the creation of this new requirement on the taxpayer, that the times were unreasonable for proper notification for the procedures to be developed by the BOE for compliance and the taxpayers are being hit with penalties that they weren't aware, they didn't know they had an obligation. And so you have, as the Chamber of Commerce uh, representative, you, you've got well below uh, compliance with the, with the law. So the revenues that we anticipated, which you know are much greater than the penalty we're talking about abating here, uh, you know, we don't have solid compliance with that. We will get better compliance with the date change. So, I but I want but I think we owe it to the taxpayers. I I feel personally obligated because I voted for this. It was it was it was in that February '09 budget agreement, and so this requirement is something that I was one of the few senators that helped create the two thirds to put it over. I feel an obligation to be fair to the taxpayers. With I feel strongly about the penalty abatement, but I also feel strongly that we ought to be clear as quickly as we can with the taxpayers and at least grant the six-month extension. So understanding your position, Madam Chair, I will remove that portion of the bill as, and offer as an author's amendment and, and ask for your favorable consideration. All right. Then my recommendation would be, uh, and I do pass. Um, uh, yes, Ms. Um, Madam Chair. I want to make sure I understood what you had said, that if somebody gets penalized right now, they mm -hmm. still can write a letter yeah, to, to, the the board of, to the Board of Equalization yeah. to yeah. get relief right. from that Perhaps, penalty. Yeah. Perhaps the BOE is here and can speak to yeah, their yeah, process. I mean, is that something no, that is here. common and people I'm know not sure. I'm not that? sure a letter will suffice. I know that a written... A, a, a request may be made, but, and my and I stated this earlier, Senator Walters, is that the cost of processing this, you know, for the BOE is in excess of the penalties that are we would abate, and and that's why it, I mean simply makes no sense. Uh, plus, you're putting the taxpayer through a whole new hoop when they've already, you know, they they and their tax preparers and advisors, you, you know, weren't even aware of this new obligation, right? Because we didn't get the information to them in time. Anyway. 
What is the process? I'm Jeff McGuire with the Board of Equalization. Um, the process is you can either, it's a request in writing is all the law requires. We do have a form. There's a link on our home page. It says if you would like to re get a relief of penalty, we put that on our home page. You can click on that. That's a form that makes it easier than just doing a letter. But a letter would suffice as well. So far, we have received over a 1,000 requests for relief of penalty um, related to this program. We've granted all of those requests for relief of penalty, and that's um, come out to $285,000 in penalties that we've already granted relief for. And uh, according to our fis the fiscal effect of doing this uh, for 07, 08, and 09, which it says in the bill, um, that would be close to 991000 That's your estimate. Yeah, the current penalties reported under the program are just about a million dollars. It's a little bit over, actually. Okay. So, uh, Senator, uh, I take your uh, I've accepted the, the amendment as you requested. All right. And, and so. uh, in that case, further discussion from the committee or questions? All right. The motion then is to pass. And would you call the rest? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Um, do pass. As amended. Please call the roll. Wolk. Aye. Wolk aye. Walters. Aye. Walters aye. Alquist. Aye. Alquist aye. Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn aye. Padilla. Five. The I five zero. It is five zero. That bill is out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. All right. Uh, let's go to uh, Senator Calderon. Uh, Assemblymember Calderon is here. Item number six, I believe, is the first. Madam Chair, you'll find that your title is the only to take with you when you leave this place. <laughs> If it pleases you, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to take up item 2078 first. Oh, I'd like that too. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, Good bill. As you know, uh, we lose billions of dollars in uh, uncollected sales and use tax, and we lose a substantial portion of use tax that cannot be collected from purchases which are made outside of California and then sent in. Um, to individuals because we can't enforce it. Can't enforce it we can't, because we can't do with use tax what we do with sales tax, and that is impose an obligation upon the uh, retailer to collect the tax for the state. And we can't do this because of an oddball decision, which happens to be the, uh, the one of the United States Supreme Court, I would argue similarly, in the vein of the right to bear arms being a fundamental right, uh, which was a decision they just came down with recently, but nevertheless, uh, their wisdom prevails. And they said, you've got to have a nexus. A nexus means physical presence. And, uh, you know, merely uh, buying things out of state, having them mailed in, purchasing matters on the Internet, having the items then subsequently mailed in is not a sufficient physical presence. And so we've been struggling with a way to be able to collect it, not, not to impose a new tax, to collect on a tax that currently exists. And it's a collection problem, uh, not a problem of whether or not we should even have the tax. So there have been a number of different ways um, that have been attempted. I still, I still think um, that, it's, that it's worth an effort, and I will try and, and see if I can uh, draft up a um, business net receipts tax that applies to those kinds of of, um, of uh, sales and that, and that particular type of business. Uh, but until then is this bill. And this bill says if you've got uh, a subsidiary or your corporation and you, own, you have a subsidiary or, as the bill says, component member of your corporation group, then the presumption is there's, a, there's an agency and there is a nexus and therefore uh, we will impose upon you the obligation to uh, collect the tax. And that's primarily what it does. Now, uh, I spoke to Caltax and a number of chamber, uh, and they've raised uh, two cases, uh, which this bill has no impact on. You know, and they will, they will talk about those. What this does is simply sets a presumption and shifts the burden of proof to the company uh, to, to show that they, they don't have a sufficient agency and therefore nexus for California to impose obligations upon them. And that's what the bill does. I would finally close by saying that this, um, this is the same language that's included currently in the Senate's budget proposal. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, in support of the bill. Yes. Um, 
Uh, Lenny Goldberg, California Tax Reform Association, also representing the Northern California and Southern California Independent Booksellers Association. Um, we are we particularly support the tax collection obligation. The information going to the BOE is a way of saying we really should have this. Um, it's something that is important to do, but the, uh, we have looked for a while at the question of whether if you have corporate to corporation tax nexus, sale, the, the standards for sales tax nexus and corporation tax nexus are different, but we do know there are wholly owned subsidiaries. For example, Amazon develops the Kindle in California. They, they develop it here. They produce it overseas. They ship it back to a warehouse in Sparks, Nevada, and then they ship it back into the state of California tax-free. On the other hand, it is developed here, and the rebuttable presumption that if you, and I would say if you have corporation tax nexus, that you have sales tax nexus, or in this case, saying that you have um, some sort, that there is a presumption that you're doing business in the state of California, it helps the collection side of it, and that is the most, I think, uh, very important provision, and hopefully will, uh, from my information, will stand or very well could stand, has not been adjudicated in the courts. The current decision is not on point here. Um, and I've looked at that over the years on many of these discussions. So we're hoping that this moves ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. In support? Further support? In opposition, please come forward. Madam Chair, members, Devin Whitney with Tech America. Actually, after having reviewed the amendments from June 24th and uh, the assemblyman having successfully mitigated the impact of the California high tech industry, Tech America has decided that we will be actually removing our opposition to AB 2078 and instead embracing a position of neutrality. Uh, we just want to thank the assemblyman uh, for his diligence for addressing our concerns, and we look forward to working with him as the bill continues to move through the Senate. Thank Good you. job. In opposition. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Mira Gurton, <clears throat> again on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce here today in opposition. Um, I, we are here primarily because the Chamber has a concern with the controlled group language and the section that was just added back to the bill in the last week. Uh, we do absolutely believe that the current versus board of equalization case and the borders online case are on point. They deal specifically with the BOE trying to uh, um, impose the use tax collection requirement on an out-of-state company based on their relationship with a controlled in-state retailer. And the court held that you cannot merely look at whether the in-state and out-state company are members of a controlled group. You have to consider whether there is an agency relationship or in the alternative in the current case whether they are in the same or similar line of business. And if those two businesses meet either one of those tests, then it is appropriate to impose that collection requirement. Um, because we believe that the case law is on point, it's existing California appellate case law, we believe this will immediately be something that is challenged on constitutional bases. Were the bill to be amended to include the factors in those cases, we would be willing to go neutral. So those are the reasons for our opposition. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Assembly member, perhaps you would like at, in your close to explain why that language is, you know, your, your opinion about that language. Yeah. Madam Chair, Tim Coyle and members of the committee. Uh, Tim Coyle, on behalf of the Direct Marketing Association, in opposition to the bill, in addition to the points made by the Chamber of Commerce about the um, so-called uh, um, uh, corporate corporation arrangement, um, we're concerned that the uh, this bill, designed to generate use tax sales tax revenue uncollected, uh, upwards of a billion dollars does not accomplish the the fundamental goal. And along the way, it creates, we think, uh, burdens on out-of-state retailers that could be avoided if uh, a different approach were taken. So um, uh, un unless the uh, notification requirement, uh, for example, which sounds benign, uh, but would, uh, we think, impose a, a burden on the retailer from out-of-state as well as create a, a competitive disadvantage for that retailer because the notification requirements and the other requirements of the bill are uh, pr likely unenforceable. Um, unless those are removed, we would uh, remain opposed to the bill. Okay, thank you. And opposition, come forward. We'll need this, the chairs. Mr. 
Michelle Peelstricker, California Taxpayers Association. I just I concur with the remarks of Ms. Gurton from Cal Chamber. I do believe the current case and the Borders case are on point, and that codifying those cases uh, within this bill would relieve the constitutional concerns. All right. Uh, further opposition? All right. Are there questions of the committee? From the committee? Move the bill. All right. The bill has been moved. Uh, in your close, perhaps. Um, uh, we've struggled with with how to confront this issue, and I applaud you for doing that. We need somehow to, um, uh, as a state and as a nation, to deal with this problem. Uh, so as this bill moves forward, um, I wish you good luck. <laughs> but more than that, um, because there were amendments that were taken out that then are put back in, maybe you'd like to speak to those issues in your close. Well, um, um it's um, partially laws and sausage. Um, uh, you know, the tech industry felt they could live with that language, even though they didn't like it. I felt that it um, it certainly sets up a um, it sets up the the fight, if you will, so we can get um, some more clarification from the court whether or not they're going to continue to go with Quill or not. Um, it creates a presumption, and it puts the burden on the out-of-state retailer to, to, to prove it. So um, I don't think, um, unless they're going to argue that the presumption is an unreasonable burden on interstate commerce, uh, I don't think this is unconstitutional. But of course, we'll find out. Um, so, so that's essentially why I changed. I mean, I mean the, you know, the um, I, again, the opposition does a great service by coming up with all these reasons why we shouldn't do the certain various proposals, because eventually they show us the way, and um, and I think the way is a business net receipts tax. I think that if we treat that as income, then we can tax it, and. Um, but, it, but that's, a, that's a broader project. And I think that in the meantime, um, this will bring in some revenue into the state because there are, um, there, I don't know that, you know, I mean, it may be challenged, it may not. It may be challenged by some, it may not, it may not be challenged by others. This protects California retailers in terms of the taxes that they have to collect that, that out-of-state retailers don't have to collect. So. Uh, modest, but it's um, you know it's in you know baby steps until we finally take that giant leap, and maybe business net receipts tax is the way to go. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a motion. Yes, we have a motion. Uh, the motion is to pass. Uh, please call the roll. Walk. Aye. Walk. Aye. Walters. No. Walters. No. Alquis. Aye. Alquis. Aye. Ashburn. No. Ashburn. No. Padilla. Aye. Padilla. Aye. Three. Two. Uh, it is 3-2. Uh, the bill is out. All right. Uh, assembly member, item number 6, which is 2060. Maybe 2060. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, Where's my assistance? It's, um, again, referring back to laws and, and sausage, it is an uh, interesting turn of events that ultimately... Uh, brings this bill before this committee. Um, in every budget process or every other legislation that we have adopted, but generally during a budget debate, uh, and the legislature has chosen to increase sales tax, there has always been an exemption for fixed price contracts. Um, and uh, in this last budget go around, um, it was an oversight. I think that's a general consensus among those that were involved in the budget process. It was an oversight that, that fixed price contracts were not excluded. Um, I carried a bill to exclude them, and it, the, the circumstances uh, were just too raw for something like that to be able to pass. Uh, but in that case, um, you know, all of uh, all these contracts that had already been negotiated, um, the um, the contractor had to eat the additional cost of of uh, sales tax. So um, so now this just applies to the future, and we may never ever raise sales tax again. Um, 
certainly that seems like the way we're going in the near future. So um, uh, there's no real cost today of this bill. Um, but it will provide that if in the future the legislature raises sales tax, that there's an exemption for fixed price contracts between those that contract, contractors and the state, those that contract with the state. And so um, it's modest. Um, <clears throat> granted, it is a tax increase that will take revenues away from other programs. But if you take a look at what of the tax uh, credits that we have passed since, since just since the beginning of this year, uh, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, this is very modest in comparison and probably has uh, a lot more equity than those tax credits. Those tax credits are designed to encourage and incentivize. Uh, this is just uh, to, to even the playing field for future contracts. So uh, with that, I, I would ask for an I vote. All right, in support of the bill. Uh, Madam Chair, Dave Ackerman, uh, representing uh, the Associated General Contractors and part of an industry-wide coalition uh, in the construction industry that's uh, sponsoring uh, uh, this legislation. Uh, Madam Chair, what we did uh, in drafting the bill, we, we went to precedence of what was done back in uh, 1989 and 91 following the Loma Parada quake when uh, actually those were, uh, uh, I believe, an uh, uh, assembly bill that uh, uh, one of your former uh, consultants, Martin Helmke, uh, drafted the original language at the request of the construction industry to deal with the fixed price contract issue. What happens, you know, we, we uh, uh, so bids are solicited to us, we bid to the public agency, and then we sign a contract. Uh, with those agencies. Many times, uh, Madam Chair, you know those contracts are ongoing. They're uh, years. Uh, a good example, uh, the Bay Bridge uh, has been more than uh, a couple of years uh, uh, during that uh, contract. In fact, that happens to be one of the contracts that's caught in the sales tax increase that took effect last April to where our contractor on the Bay Bridge is absorbing the uh, sales tax hike on steel, concrete, and other materials that they're, they're buying on that. The reason they are is they, they uh, entered into a fixed price contract. Uh, the way the fixed price contracts works, you bid at lump sum. Uh, you don't specify the tax rate in your contract, but you bid at lump sum to where uh, it includes all applicable taxes as part of the, the contract. What this legislation does is uses the precedence that was done in 1989 and 1991, and also we have the same precedent of an ongoing exemption on fixed price contracts in local sales taxes, such as uh, Measure R, which was approved in Los Angeles last year. Contractors who have the fixed price contracts also have the benefit of what we're asking for in this bill. So what we tried to do, uh, Madam Chair, is uh, use precedent uh, to establish and take the approach we did with this legislation, and we do ask for your I vote. Okay, thank you. In support. Uh, members of the committee, uh, Kevin Pedrotti representing the Engineering and Utility Contractors Association and the Golden State Builders Exchanges. Not to repeat what the Senator and Mr. Ackerman have said, but we just feel that this is a pretty uh, modest proposal and uh, brings some fairness into the system. Thank you. Okay, thank you. In support, I think just... Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Park think. Terry, representing the California Landscape Contractors Association. We're also in strong support. Okay, Madam you. Chair, Phil Vermeulen, representing the Engineering Contractors, Flasher Barricade Association, Marin Builders Exchange, and Fence Contractors. Uh, this is a matter of fairness, and we absolutely need this. Just, yeah, Thank just you. ID. Support. I just Bob Houston on behalf of the concrete contractors and also the cement manufacturers in the state of California, drywall contractors and precasters. Uh, you know, if we have our generals get paid, then we're supposed to support the bill. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Chris Walker on behalf of the California Association of Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors, small businesses support this bill. Okay. Scott Governor on behalf of the Construction Employers Association in support. Good morning, Greg Hines, California Manufacturers and Technology Association, also in support. Michelle Peelstricker, California Taxpayers Association, in support. Madam Chair, Todd Bloomstein for the Southern California Contractors Association, in support. Further support? Opposition. Seeing none, uh, comments or questions from the committee? Bill has been moved. The, uh, a couple questions, uh, Madam Chair. I know we've been talking about it uh, prior to the committee. Had a chance to uh, not only deal with the sponsors, but with uh, uh, some of Member Calderon as well. Uh, you laid out the presentation very clearly. I just want to sort of emphasize, if not clarify, 
what you're suggesting here is nothing new uh, to what the state does if we look at what happened in 1989 and 1991. That is correct. I know part of the uh, tough decision that we have to make here is any either current or potential future impacts to the state's general fund. Uh, and as sensitive as I am to that, I'm uh, even more so moved by an issue of fairness. Uh, fairness to folks who have entered into contracts, uh, particularly with public agencies, only to have sort of during the term of that contract, the state raise the sales tax affecting you know, not just spreadsheets but bottom lines uh, and an ability to deliver projects on time, on budget, uh, employers to meet payroll, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it would seem to me uh, to be only fair to those entities that the state do once again uh, what it's done in the past. Uh, not, I, I'm sure we can call it the legislative history on the, the spirit and intent of why the state took those actions the way it did in 1989 and in 1991. When I first heard about this bill, uh, I was initially under the impression that it sought to apply that provision to the current temporary sales tax increase. Uh, but that is not the case. The language of the bill is only prospective to potential future sales tax increase, uh, consistent with what state code already calls for for local sales tax increase. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So what, what I'm not sure of right now is uh, from a procedural standpoint, I know this committee has a suspense file. Uh, I don't know if the bill moves out of today, if it would go straight to the floor, or if it would be referred to the Senate Appropriations Committee because of any potential general fund impact, and even then how that would be quantified given that we're talking about it being prospective, not retroactive, uh, but again, driven uh, by my sense of fairness here and wanting to support the policy uh, not sure it's a question to the author, but maybe to the chair of what the options are for, for action here. Well, there are a number of different options. Um, and I think, uh, why don't, uh, you know, I disagree with, with uh, the, the policy in this bill and the cost uh, for me is a major issue. Uh, in the 09 sales tax, uh, there was no, this was not uh, uh, added uh, to uh, the 09 sales tax issue um, uh, action. Uh, by doing this uh, prospectively, according to um, the uh, BOE, it could cost well over a million dollars. In addition, the way this is set up, it's not, you're not just talking about governmental entities. You're talking about small businesses as well. Uh, it's really open-ended. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in that case, um, it does uh, become a criteria for our suspense file. Um, so, you know, there, there are several ways we can proceed. Uh, my recommendation will be a no. Um, if the committee wishes to move this forward, uh, it would go to a probes. And uh, because of the cost, uh, and they do include uh, prospective costs, uh, which we I believe we should as well, although we um, are um, the language in our suspense criteria is unclear, and it won't be next year, but it is now. Uh, so if the committee's will is to move this forward, that's fine. I will vote no, uh, and it will go to the uh, Appropriations Committee. And, and I've made the motion. You have made the motion. Further, further questions? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. This is actually a tough bill to vote on, <laughs> even tougher than the last one, and I represent Silicon Valley. And so I'd like to just say different kinds of thoughts. Um, if the chair wanted to put it into suspense in order to craft a better bill here, I'd be willing to do that. I came in here thinking I would vote no. And, I, and yet I do see reasons to vote yes. And I'm going to ask you if some things are in the current bill because they would be things that I think would make it a better bill. Number one, is it limited? And then I don't know. And then in also being on appropriations with the fiscal costs, 
I might vote no because of of the money piece, and, and so another reason to kind of work with the chair on this. Is this limited to fixed price contracts between the, these construction contractors and the state? And does th this only apply when there's been a contract agreed to and then after that, the state does a sales tax increase. And, and you're saying that because in good faith the contract was negotiated, perhaps even a huge contract, and then the state does a sales tax increase, that then the contractor really is not able to uh, meet the terms of the agreement because everything has changed, the, the financial picture has changed. Is, first of all, is that part true? Yes. Okay. Sec uh, yes. Okay. Second part. Excuse uh, me, um, Senator, I, I just wanted to let you know that in working with the um, Senator's staff, we suggested amendments uh, last week uh, that would say that if indeed in these public contracts a contractor um, uh, if there were agreement that they could submit a change order uh, and we, that would be part of the public contract code and we would send that to GEO. Uh, those amendments, um, and it's unclear what exactly happened, but they it, are not before us. It sounds like that kind of amendment is something that would, if what I said is it in the bill already. Else to decide. <laughs> uh, no, we want to decide this. No, but <laughs> so I'm just saying, it, it, if the way I presented it, which is a matter of fairness, is already in the bill, that's one thing. If and, and if the chair is saying that it's she offered suggestions to get it there, which were not taken, maybe the bill needs to go to suspense to kind of work on that. That's one piece. The other piece that I would put in is to say, um, not as firm on this one, but uh, perhaps. It's, Perhaps this should not be operational during, during re recessionary years. You know, w when we're having a good economy, it's one thing, but uh, we're, when we're having problems like we are right now, $2 million is $2 million. Well, uh, let me kind of respond to the first. The first is that um, there, there were amendments that were discussed between mm -hmm. myself and, and the chair and, and our respective staffs. And, um, that was another way around the same bush, and um, um, and I was looking at those uh, because uh, the chair and I understand. I I was this way when I was chairing revenue tax and assembly. I you know I couldn't understand why all these tax credits were being brought in when we had this huge deficit. But so I looked at, at doing that, um, but. Because it took a while to get there, and it took a while before us, you know, discussions. I ran out of time. Is what I did. Um, I would need to happens. get it. I would need to get an urgency, which is pretty easy to do. It can be to turn around in one day. But then the question was, after amended, this bill would go to GO. Was GO going to meet? And we contacted GO, and he said, "Well, we think so, but we're not scheduled for any, and we can't guarantee it's not going to meet." So, um, so I'll take I'll take responsibility for running out of time. Because it's my responsibility, but but it wasn't, you know, if, if that was that was another way to accomplish it, a few more steps. Um, but that's why we we were we were considering going that way, and then we ran out of time. Because then I bless you. I think it really is a matter of fairness if the contractor has agreed with the state. You know, there's a, there's a huge contract, and I'll, and then after that, the the state does the sales tax increase. It would be fair to exempt, mm -hmm. I believe. But I think the bill really needs to be really clear that it's, you know, this is a very small domain. It's a very small category. And it sounds like from what the chair said that the bill needs a few more amendments and perhaps going to suspense and working on this might be a good thing to do. I would like to be in a position uh, to see a really good bill. Uh, I, I don't know, but from what I've heard, so correct me if I'm wrong, I believe uh, a significant part of the amendments that are being referenced here mm -hmm. is to have amended a bill in a way that for the public sector 
Correct. six contracts mm -hmm. yes. in, in non-technical terms. We'd amend it in a way where instead of the state being on the hook for the differential due to the sales tax increase, it would be those local public entities on the hook for that differential. Is that correct or incorrect? Is that correct? Um, I think if I may comment, I think we're looking at public contracts where the state sales tax applies to both a state project and a local project. So you'd be looking at, uh, at the state sales tax application to a fixed price contract. So it could be at the local level or at the state level. No, when, when that, that wasn't the focus of the amendments that are being referenced here no. that the author chose not to take. No, the focus were, was to approach it from the other end. Right, right now, the um, the state doesn't doesn't. That's, I don't think the state has authority to be able to approve change orders based on increased taxes that weren't in effect when the contract was entered into. Right. So we would have to change right. the state's that's ability to be able to do that. Uh, in which case, it, it accomplishes the same thing. And this That's goes correct. at it. This goes at it. That is correct. A different way. This this goes at it. It's a better policy. Uh, but I ran out of time, and and I, um, you know, I wanted a fair shot to try and get that bill out, uh, understanding how the how the chair felt about this bill. But but I would argue, um, and I'll you know, we don't know if we're going to have another tax increase. Boy, if I mean, I get in trouble for voting for every tax that comes before me, but. Uh, I don't know if we're going to ever really negotiate that. We may negotiate another sales tax. I personally would like to eliminate sales tax and increase personal income tax and then pass it off to the federal government in re tax returns. But having said that, we may not even have. But if we did, uh, I would even argue that it's still revenue neutral because, because we changed the game or we changed the rules in the middle of the game for these contractors and they had to eat the tax. So assuming that a similar group were to benefit in the future, um, it, I would at least make that argument. Certainly, without knowing what the actual numbers are, we can only speculate. But you have that equity in place. They ate, they ate the, the, the tax here. So if we let a group of contractors off in the future, it's a wash. Assuming, assuming we... Um, that's a jury argument, but you know it works. It You're works. a lawyer. I'm a mathematician. <laughs> All right. Any further questions? All right. Well, uh, you may close. We have a motion. Oh, may, may I make oh, yes, a, I'm a sorry. point? Go ahead. I guess I don't understand whether you are willing to let the bill, because, I mean, I have to figure out how I'm going to vote on this. And I've expressed what kind of shape I think the bill should be in, uh, to make it a good bill, and that is it should be very specific. It should just limit um, uh, contracts, uh, fixed-price contracts with uh, state, state government, state mm -hmm. entities, state government, uh, where an agreed price, where a, a price, there's been a contract, it's been agreed, and then the state does a, a, a sales tax increase. And Yes. Simply, I mean, and I would ask the chair, yes. is the bill in that, do you? No, the bill also includes, um, and that's what I broader need than that, that um, it includes yeah. small businesses, um, and again, there's the cost, okay. and it's open-ended into the future. And just on a final point for me, not an additional question, uh, recognizing that, yes, prospectively, there would be some additional costs. Uh, I'm driven by the point of fairness, number one, number two. Uh, the inability to quantify, because we don't know if we're talking about a one-cent sales tax mm -hmm. increase, a quarter-cent sales tax increase, if it's a permanent sales tax increase, a one- or two-year sales tax increase. You know, you can model it out very, very low, very, very high. Uh, but So I, I'm not approaching this bill by a specific number fiscal impact to the state this year or in future years. Just as a matter of policy, out of fairness to contracts that are in, entered into prior to the state raising sales tax, uh, should we recognize uh, the natures of a fixed term contracts uh, or not? And I believe we should. And for another point of clarification, Madam Chair, I would be willing uh, to vote for a bill that uh, limits this to fixed price contracts between the contractor and the state of California, not to include small business because I think the real issue is that it's the state of California that would be raising the tax, the sales tax on, on, on the entity, uh, the contractor. 
and um, so if the bill remains broader as it seems to be, I would not be able to support that. Um, and that certainly is your choice because I will get to appropriations and then the $2 million so problem will be raising its head again. So I, I, I want you to do just what you want to do, but I just wanted to explain. Well, can I ask a, a, a question in terms of, of your proposal um, or, or, or the kind of bill you can vote for? If there's a contract with – this bill clearly c covers a contract between a contractor and the state and then the state raises the taxes. Mm -hmm. But there are contracts that are negotiated with other governments. Other governments? Local government, right? That would be cities, counties, school districts. When we bid the contract to those, we we bid the state sales tax on the purchase of materials and supplies, the state sales tax rates included on in those contracts too. So the state sales tax does not apply only to contracts with the state. Agencies. It also applies to contracts with other contracts. governmental agencies. I think what I, I heard you, Senator, saying, I think, was that you want this limited to public contracts. Yes. Public yes. contracts. Mm -hmm. Well, that it is limited to public contracts, is it not? Well, there, there is. No, it's not. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's also small business. Well, I would, I would agree to limit it um, because, the, because the, the, you know, the, the, everybody well, – I was forced to accept that amendment. The current rules um, allow us to get the bill in shape. We want to take it up before committees. I would be willing to take uh, that amendment and just limit this to public contracts and then deal with it when it comes back to my I house. think that would be a fair bill. Okay. It was uh, amended. With that amendment, I'm even okay. happier with it. To state government. Public contracts. Public, public, public contracts, state and local governments. Public, 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 state and local. public entities. Yeah. Public agencies. Public, public, public agencies. Contracts with public agencies. Or, fi or you can finalize that language in a probes. And there's an additional technical amendment recommended by the analysis on um, on page four. It's clarification. It's it's item. E mm -hmm. clarification. Uh, we would accept that as an author's That's amendment as well. Included in the motion. All right. It has been um, moved. This pass has amended the appropriations. Um, Please call the roll. Wolk. No. Wolk. No. Walters. Uh, yes. Walters. Uh, aye. Alquist. Aye. Alquist. Aye. Ashburn. Aye. Ashburn. Aye. Padilla. Aye. Padilla. Aye. The vote is 4-1, uh, and, uh, and it passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, let's open the roll, beginning with, um, let's see, did we finish item one? Were we all here for item one? Yes. Okay, then we're moving on. Um, item two, is the roll open on item two? Yes, it is. All right, uh, please open the roll for AB 157, uh, Assemblymember Anderson. That one's done. On item number three, AB 1341, uh, uh, Assemblymember Lowenthal, please uh, c call the roll. Alquist. Aye. Alquist, aye. Five zero. Five zero. That bill is out. Uh, Assemblymember Swanson, AB 1973, please call the roll. Alquist. Uh, the absent members. Alquist. Uh, recommendation was to pass. Aye. Alquist, aye. Five zero. Five to zero. That bill is out. Item number five, Assembly Member Hall, AB 2017. Uh, the uh, recommendation is to pass. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. 4-1. Four, 4-1. One. Four, one. That bill is out. Um, Can we see here for the for night? Okay. Uh, item number nine, AB 2375, reconsideration vote only. Chair recommends no. Alquist? No. Alquist, no. That's 3-1. Bill. Oh, okay. Padilla, yeah. uh, Padilla, no. So that's 4-1. That's 2-3. Two, 2-3. Two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 2-3, the bill fails. All right, we have, have, uh, we have AB 157, Assemblymember Anderson, and that's item number two. Please open the roll. Oh, she did. Okay. Alquist. Aye. Alquist, aye. Bill's up. The bill is out. All right. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you. See, we are adjourned.